Tech Time Traveler here, and today I have the digital paintbrush system by the Computer Colorworks Company. Um, this is basically a digitizing pen for the Apple IIe. So you can see we've got a guy with a IIe there and he's got a pen. I think it also will work on an Apple II Plus. I don't know if there's any reason why it wouldn't. Um, but yeah, this is more Apple IIe era, I think. And uh, yeah, it looks pretty fancy. This is uh, not a toy like the Koala Pad. Uh, this appears to be a serious digitizer system that uh, had commercial applications. I was always fascinated when I was a kid with digitizing technology. Um, just the idea of being able to draw on a digital screen uh, just seemed really uh, neat, um, you know, because in my day we drew on paper and paper was a finite thing. Uh, once you use it all up, you had to go out and buy more. Um, whereas this, you could just endlessly draw whatever you wanted and it was like uh, having a window into a, a different dimension almost. And, you know, we kind of take this technology for granted. I can uh, pull out my Galaxy Note 20 and uh, draw something on a little five and a bit inch screen uh, and it's no big thing. Um, I can press on the screen with my fingers and choose different icons or run apps or play games or whatever. Uh, and that sort of technology did exist when I was a kid in the 80s, but it was really rare and it was really expensive. The first experience I had with anything approaching a digitizer would have been a koala pad that my dad borrowed from a friend of ours who owned a, a computer store and uh, decided to let us play with it for a little bit and see if we were interested in buying it. And I found that interesting. The computer we were using it with was a VIC-20. The VIC-20 maybe wasn't up to the task of doing really detailed drawings. Uh, we mostly played that uh, silly dancing bear game uh, that it came with. And my dad eventually decided, uh, no, it's too much money for too little utility and out it went. And you know, that's the way it was. Computer hardware was incredibly expensive back in the 80s. And yeah, I didn't see another digitizer, pen, light pen, anything like that again uh, until much, much later. Um, something like this, absolutely no way my dad was sprung for this. Uh, uh, this thing definitely carried a significant price tag and the computer that it was attached to was crazy expensive compared to the Commodore 64 that I had by this point. So yeah, I, I don't think uh, we would have ever had a chance to, to use this. So one of the things that caught my eye was this, this uh, tablet-like thing here and I was kind of looking at it and going, that's kind of weird, like why? What does that exactly do? Like, cause to me, I'm thinking, you know, it's like a koala pad you have a pen and you have a, a sensor, like a touchpad, and then the computer interprets whatever information it gets from there. But when I was looking at it, you know, it's got kind of a bend in it there. And then it's got this weird, I don't know what this tab is for, but yeah, it doesn't look like something that you would put paper on and draw on. So that really got me curious. And because the picture's so small, I couldn't actually see the mechanism by which this was was operating. So yeah, I was a little bit confused by that and I was intrigued. So yeah, put in a low ball bid and nobody else bid on it and it was mine. And so yeah, I thought it'd be fun just as a little side venture as I'm working my way through other videos, uh, just to pull this out finally and uh, see what it can do. And yeah, what it can do uh, looks to be fairly impressive, um, especially when you consider the, the technology of the time. And what's interesting about it to me is, uh, you know, that this was targeted at a professional market, um, you know, for design purposes. You can see here, they've got sort of a, a medical diagram. This is a time when photorealistic graphics didn't really exist. And I mean, this is definitely worlds away from the type of design programs we have available now. Uh, but in its day, yeah, it looks pretty impressive. Another thing that's really interesting is this um, draw interactively over phone lines via modem. So this thing had the ability to be collaborative with another computer. You could actually sit there together and work together on a, on a drawing, um, kind of almost like a, like a Teams kind of thing. So yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, for 1984, 85, whenever this came out. The only thing I was able to find on it was uh, an article in InfoWorld, and generally it was pretty positive. It said, you know, it was a fairly decent value, and uh, yeah, it did exactly what it promised to do within the limitations of the computer. So yeah, so you're probably wondering, like I am, 
how does this actually work? Um, because obviously to digitize, the computer needs some way to know the position of the drawing device, right? And we're gonna assume that this pen doesn't have some sort of ultra high tech scanner in the head where it's just sort of following the paper around and reporting that back to the computer. We didn't have that kind of technology available to my knowledge at all, maybe, maybe it was, but not cheaply. Um, so yeah, let's, let's open her up here and see exactly how this system works. All right, so there is the digital paintbrush. So this is the tablet. I'll just pull it out here. So on one end, it looks like we've got, uh, yeah, one of these uh, dip joystick connector thingies. Oh, I hate these on the Apple II and especially on the Apple IIe because the socket for this is located right under the lip of the case and it's really awkward to get these things down in there. So yeah, I'm not looking forward to that. I am glad to see that it came with a protector and some <laughs> really dried out masking tape. Um, the pins are in good shape, so yeah, hopefully this will work just fine. So now we get to the pen. So how have they done this? And the answer is, ta-da! <laughs> it's on a string. That's how they've done it. Yeah, so isn't that interesting? Oh, that's kind of weird. Okay, so yeah, basically what you've got is you've got the stylus and then you've got these two lines that are attached to either side of it. And it looks like there's basically a couple of spring-loaded wheels in here and they basically pull in the slack from the line. And if I were to guess, I would say probably there are potentiometers inside and based on the relative uh, resistance that each is at, uh, that tells the computer approximately what position the pen is in. Now, one thing I'm noticing as I'm looking at this, uh, the serial number is really, really low. It's 397. Um, that leads me to believe that there probably weren't that many of these things built. Uh, and in fact, this is the only one I've ever seen come up for sale anywhere. And uh, I kind of looked online for other people that had them, but uh, there didn't seem to be very many. So this may be one of those products that, you know, looked really good on paper, but maybe wasn't successful, not so much owing to the limitations of the device itself, but the, the limitations of the computer it was attached to. So, yeah, <laughs> kind, of a, kind of a novel way to do it. Um, yeah, so this is not a drawing surface then. This is basically, um, just a, a box to hold the, the wheels. Um, and I'm guessing this, I don't know what this is. Maybe this is just a, uh, is it a brake? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So this acts as a brake, I guess, to stop. You can just basically stow it, or you can stow it off the side here. That's interesting. Yeah, that's, um, let's see here. I mean, it's got a pretty good range of motion. I mean, you could work on a fairly large drawing with this. Um, you know, obviously it's a little weird to draw with two lines pulling on your pen, but um, it's it's not, the, the pulling force on these is not so strong that it, it feels really awkward. Um, yeah, no, it's that's not bad actually. It's just a little <laughs> strange. I would not want to have this and have a cat at the same time because I think this would just invite all kinds of trouble. So looking at the stylus, it looks like we've got a a button up here, and then the stylus tip also clicks. So yeah, that's um, I mean it's pretty clever. You know, right? It, whatever works. It it looks hokey, but it's it clearly is capable of of doing the job. Yeah. So that's the that's the digitizer. Um, and then I think you can 
set the pin off to the side here in this little holder. I think the holder may be broken. I think there's pieces of that missing, unfortunately. So that's why it's not staying put. Um, also in the box, set this aside for a second, we have the Digital Paintbrush System book. And this is, uh, this is pretty substantial. This is not a, a thin little uh, brochure style thing. Uh, so we've got some discs here, all the main program discs, and look at all this stuff. Program disc for graphic design program, text screen editor, presentation program, printout program, fonts, uh, utility programs, area measurement, graph grabber, DP interface program, pod adjustment program, library images on the back of the disc. And then we have the graphics telephone program, which is the whole, uh, you know, I called it the Teams like thing. It's not really like Teams, but it's the closest analog I can think of. And here's the book, the Digital Paintbrush System, copyright 1984 by the Computer Color Works in Sausalito, Sausalito, California. Wow, the book's in decent shape. Uh, so let's see, the Computer Color Workers. These are all the guys. If anybody out there knows one of these names, or if you're one of the people that uh, worked on this and uh, was watching, I'd love to hear from you. We got some special thanks to some other folks down here. And it looks like Computer Color Works is a division of Jandal Corporation. Okay, so let's see what we've got going on here. The digital paintbrush is a high resolution input device for entering graphics or precise quantitative input into a microcomputer. The digital paintbrush consists of a pen with a switch on its side, which we call the menu button, and then another in its tip, which we call the pen tip. <laughs> and then there are two thin Dacron lines that are connected from the pen to wheels inside the main housing, exactly what I suspected. These lines inform the computer of the location of the pen. When the pen is pressed against a surface, the switch in the pen tip is activated and sensed by the software. The switch on the side of the pen, the menu button, is also sensed by the software. It kind of follows. The pen can be used on any drawing surface, allowing for versatile operations, including tracing illustrations from books or cloth material. So yeah, that's kind of a, a nice advantage uh, to going with the system they've gone with, right? You're not restricted to the size of the tablet or the thickness of the material. You can pretty much trace whatever you want with this thing as long as you can uh, maneuver the pen around it and the, the little fishing wires, uh, you're good. Um, so yeah, these are instructions on how to unpack it. There is that nasty plug, which uh, this is not really where it is. It's underneath this lip here on the Apple IIe and yeah, I, I just hate trying to plug things into that. Um, calibration. Okay, so they do do calibration. That's what that disc was for. Um, and you can calibrate it using the calibration holes, um, which are on either side. So, yeah, by uh, running the program, you just basically press the pen into these little indents. And they're probably going to be impossible to see on the camera, but there's one right there. And then there's one right over here as well. And the pen just basically pops into them like that. And then the software knows, okay, this is where those two extremities are. And now I know how to calculate uh, all the other positions the pen is in. Um, maintenance and care of the digital paintbrush. The digital paintbrush requires no regular maintenance or lubrication of its moving parts. Do not apply lubricants or chemicals to any part of the device. Perfect. That is exactly the sort of device that thrives around here. Uh, replacement of the stylus. The non-writing plastic pen stylus included in the pen can be easily interchanged with the ballpoint pen stylus included in the package. Ooh. Ooh. That's something I don't think I have. Uh, let's check the box here, but... Yeah. Um, so I wonder, is this considered a ballpoint or is this a non-writing? So this can be actually popped off. Basically just unscrew the pen like that. 
don't know what's this in here. It's just so this is the stylus, I guess. So you can basically swap this with a, a different one. I don't know which one this is, if this is the ballpoint or the non-drawing, unfortunately. Um, we just don't have the other one to, to show you, but yeah, that's interesting. This thing's pretty uh, well-featured. Uh, this is not a cheap little you know, amusement piece here. This is a, a serious tool. Loss of Dacron line tension. Under certain unusual circumstances, such as dropping the DP <laughs> or jerking hard <laughs> on the Dacron lines, one of the lines may come off its wheel. This results in loss of tension on that line when you let go of the pen and increased resistance when you pull the pen away from the DP housing. The, the DP is designed, sorry, it's 2021 and yeah, or it's, it's just, this is not appropriate. But anyway, uh, the DP is designed with an automatic mechanism for replacing the line. If a line comes off its wheel, guide it back on track by pulling it by hand slowly, steadily, and strongly with a few pounds of force. Do not jerk it. Pull slowly. You will not break the line. It has a test strength of 40 pounds. Continue to pull slowly and strongly. If the line stops after about one half inch, release it and pull again. After you have pulled it about 10 inches, you will feel a slight snap. The line is now back on track. Well, that's interesting. You know, I kind of wondered about that. You know, like anybody that's had a fishing rod, um, you know that you can get things kind of tangled up pretty easily uh, if the line comes off the spool in the wrong place. So yeah, that's cool that it has a self-correcting mechanism. You just basically pull it straight out and yeah, that somehow guides it back onto the spool and then everything's good. But uh, as you can see, we don't need to do that because it's obviously working. The digital paintbrush system includes several diskettes. Yeah, we've, we've seen all those. Um, tips and hints. It is best to place your drawing paper under the clip under the digital paintbrush housing. This keeps the paper in a fixed position and out of the pen's way. Ah, okay, I was wrong. So this is not to hold the line in place. This is to hold your paper. Okay, so you basically just stick your paper in there with this lifted up and then let it down and that keeps your paper from sliding around. All right, that's making sense. When using the five by three and three quarters drawing area to trace small pictures from magazines or designs from cloth, please place the DP on top of the magazine and adjust the magazine's position until the picture lies within the drawing area. I guess you're supposed to just sort of know where that is. Check to see that the Dacron lines are not crossed, obviously. Um, the non-writing plastic stylus is slightly longer than the ink-filled stylus. Oh, so that's interesting. So this must be the non-writing stylus because they're saying that there's an ink-filled stylus available. So, so yeah, I guess this could operate as an actual pen. Not really sure why you'd want to do that, but yeah, that would be cool. Well, that would explain why it's not in the box because that probably was exhausted a long time ago. It may over time become twisted and cause a slight jump in the potentiometer wheel when each twist in the Dacron line passes the nylon post in the DP. The line can be straightened. Okay, so, so it's free to rotate about Yeah, I'm not sure what they mean there, but uh, okay, then we have the graphic design program. This just kind of goes over how all that works. Now let's take a look at the telephone graphics program because that's really interesting to me. It's one thing to just be drawing by yourself, but it's another thing to be able to collaborate with somebody remotely, especially in 1984. So here's all of our drawing tools, basically the standard stuff. And then we get into the transport menu. Pick this if you're already talking and want to draw. Look <laughs> at the lips there. Pick this when you have been drawing and want to talk. Dial the phone, answer delayed, disconnect GX from the phone line. Not sure what the GX is. Initialize a disk, send a disk file to remote disk, save the screen to disk, start or end a session file, delete from a file from a disk, show a catalog of the diskette, load a raw binary picture from disk, retrieve a session file, 
select drive one, select drive two, and transfer graphics, transfer to the graphics menu. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I, I really wish I had a way to, to make this operate. Now, I actually have an Apple II modem. Unfortunately, I don't have any way to connect two Apple IIEs together. Even if I had two modems, I still only have one landline and uh, yeah, I don't know. Being digital, it might not work anyway. But certainly fire this program up just to look at it, see what it lets us do. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, I've got a utility pack. Uh, so we've got some fonts. It's always handy. We've got some library images with pre-designed pictures, symbols, and images. I would have loved to play with that when I was a kid. Uh, the Graph Grabber is a utility program on the utility disk that allows you to use graphs created with Software Publishing Corp's PFS Graph. It will also allow you to grab screen images created with many other programs. That's cool. Uh, potentiometer adjustment, that's your calibration tool. Uh, digital, digital paintbrush interface program. Um, read this section if you want to use the DP as an input device for programs you write yourself. If you don't write software programs, feel free to skip this section. Yeah, so I guess these would be similar to the routines you might use. Uh, if you were incorporating joystick control into a basic game or something like that. Yeah, that's kind of cool. I'd love to figure out a way to incorporate it into something like that. And this just explains what all the commands do. Oh, and here we have fonts. I mean, those look pretty awesome. If that's how the machine can actually display them. I mean, for 1984, got a little mail icon, something we're familiar with in 2021. I think that's a fire extinguisher, a cigarettes, <laughs> a little more common back then, a fridge. And that looks like a heroin problem. <laughs> um, a tap, I don't know what that is, clock. Yeah, there's some uh, your standard card symbols, coins. Um, yeah television set. Oh, I would have loved playing with this stuff when I was a kid. It's my favorite thing to do with my Vic was just to break out the graphics mode and just draw stuff on the screen until I accidentally hit enter and the computer complained. Uh, presentation. So this is, uh, you know, this is your 1984 version of PowerPoint, I guess. Wow. <laughs> Look at those graphs. Yeah. Yeah, those would have been very exciting in 1984. Today, eh, not so much. Don't really convey a lot of useful information there. Uh, what else have we got here? Uh, this is, yeah, so this is uh, another obvious use for this thing is to draw architectural stuff. I definitely uh, aspire to do that when I was a kid. I used to draw house plans and uh, build stuff out of Lego. So yeah, that would totally be down for me. Uh, but I'm not an artist. Okay, so this is just how to draw. Image design, use, and meaning. When drawing an image, such as those included on the utility disk, do not try to duplicate or sketch exactly what your eye sees. Apple resolution will not permit it. Rather, work towards a representation of the image. So yeah, this is this is obviously one of the limitations that you had to deal with, right? This isn't a high resolution computer. You can't just take, you know, a really complex, I don't know, cartoon or photograph or something and draw it down to the most minute detail and expect that the Apple II is going to be able to, to interpret that because it just can't. You're, you're trying to get basically just a representation. And that's just a limit of the technology of the time. Um, then they go into computer photography. Uh, 35 millimeter single lens reflex camera with manual controls, steady tripod, cable release, telephoto lens. Now, why would you need a camera in film? Well, because, you know, most boardrooms, most offices back in the day would not have had a projection television system or something that would allow you to display your presentation to a large number of people. Um, I actually 
as a kid, my dad used to take us into his various offices that he worked at, and I don't think I ever saw a projector there. Uh, not for computers, not for television, but I did see uh, lots of slide projectors. That was the most common way to do presentations back in the day. That's PowerPoint was kind of designed to, to emulate a, a slide projection type presentation. So yeah, this you would be typically taking pictures of what was on screen and then basically showing those on a uh, low tech slide projector to everybody. Now you could use a large screen TV if you had access to one, uh, if you had access to, um, you know, one of those three color projectors that were crazy expensive. Uh, but yeah, otherwise, you know, you had the option of taking pictures of your screen. Uh, seems kind of backwards, but yeah, that's the way it was. And then these are the font packs. So that's interesting. Um, it looks like the floor plan is actually, like the pieces of it that you use to draw floor plans are fonts, I guess. I've also got electronic symbols. We've got flowchart stuff. Uh, we've got icons, of course. We've got the USS Enterprise. That seems to be tied into every damn computer ever. <laughs> what is <laughs> this? <laughs> This is flipping the bird to somebody. <laughs> that's kind of risque for a, uh, a pro. I mean, that's that's the middle finger, right? Holy smokes! That's <laughs> I'd be using that one all day long as a kid, hundred percent. Uh, we've also got music, RAM symbols. Uh, look at all these fonts. Yeah, I mean, if if this is what they actually look like on the computer, that would be pretty awesome for a 1984 computer. And then we've got some more fonts here. This is computer. This is actually a font that I often look for for some of my videos because uh, this was popular in the 70s and early 80s. It's like Dave O'Brien did a few of these. Uh, Fashion, Gaston by Deborah Grove. Jim Scheller did uh, Hess, Limited, Dave O'Brien again, Dave O'Brien, Dave O'Brien, Linux and Parisian, Ping No and Rocky, Xenon, Silver Screen, wow. I'm making a composite character from the graphic writer, the plotting quality should, should be set to overlay. You'll also find it helpful to use Control G in graphics mode to assist in positioning the characters. Huh. I don't know what they mean by overlay. Well, anyway, we'll uh, we'll check all this stuff out on the computer, and then we'll, we'll kind of see what's what. Okay, so I thought for fun, I would actually try and use this device for one of the things it was designed for, which was basically tracing images. And uh, I figured for an image to trace, what better could we do than Garfield? Kind of an icon of the 80s. And actually, I think this drawing will work reasonably well because, you know, it's fairly big. There's not a whole lot of detail to it. So I'm hopeful it will come out looking somewhat <laughs> like it's supposed to. Um, and I guess we'll find out. So yeah, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll load this into our graphic design program. And while it's doing that, I'm gonna use the paper holder, not the pen holder, to lock that down. Man, they thought of everything with this thing. And I'll just make sure I can freely move around the drawing. Yes, I can. So yeah, this should be a pretty interesting test of this pen's abilities and uh, a case study in the limitations of the computer. Okay, so we can see we've got our little flashing cursor there. And yeah, I mean, it moves around pretty good. It tracks the pen fairly well, so that's all right. So down the side here, we've got this menu system. Now I can dismiss that uh, by pressing the menu button here on the pen and it goes away like that. And of course I could choose, you know, a bunch of different things. I could choose like a circle um, like this here and I just go 
And then, yeah, I don't even have to be touching the paper. I can just sort of drag the thing out. It looks like you click once and then drag it to the size you want. And then there you go. Uh, if I wanted to fill it, I could do that. And then I just drop it in there. Uh, and if I wanted to make, let's say a little mini Death Star, <laughs> because if we've got Star Trek involved here, we also got to get Star Wars involved. Uh, then we can do a circle and we can just draw a little, yeah, that's going to be pretty lame. I don't know if this is really going to work or not. I don't really know where, huh, that's interesting. Doesn't seem to want to put our circle there. Uh, why is that? Oh, I bet I know why. Uh, that's probably because I don't have the fill set to solid. So let's try, I'll just try changing the color to black and see what happens. <laughs> and let's try actually selecting circle instead of fill. Yeah, so it's not quite what you're used to with a modern paint program, but you know, it's uh, it's workable. Uh, what are grids here? Uh, okay, that's interesting. Uh, micro, I don't know what that does. It's like it kind of fixes on a certain area or something. Oh, I see. So it just lets you draw within that area. Okay. I need to get out of this mode. So I understand it. Alpha would be letters. So yeah, you could do that. I don't think this program allows you to bring in any additional fonts. I think it just uses whatever the default is there. Um, I think anyway, let me just check and see. No, it's nothing under brush. Okay. Oh, I'm gonna just clear this so we can get to our drawing, which was the main idea. Uh, now, obviously we're gonna be drawing in black, so we wanna do a fill. You'll note that there's two different blacks and there's two different whites, and that's because there's a couple different palettes. Um, I'm a little rusty on the Apple II color palette, but basically certain colors uh, can't adjoin one another depending on which palette you're in. So I'm just gonna to switch to white here, and then I'm gonna go to main and I'm on fill and I'm just going to dump the entire screen with white. And it gives us a nice white background to work with. Now I'm going to switch to draw mode. I'm going to switch to brush. And I think I want the second black if I want to get the orangey kind of color in there. Okay, so I've got it in draw mode, I've got it in black. Um, I'm just going to go back here and yeah, I've got it on the smallest brush. You can make it larger, but of course the larger you make it, the more difficult it is to get detail in there. So we're going to go with the smallest one. So yeah, I think we're ready. So I'm just going to start with the ears here and just kind of trace this around and I'm trying to strike a balance between being quick enough that it doesn't sit there because whenever this pen tip is pressed, it's interpreting that as incoming data. So if I sit on a space too long, it's going to gradually fill it. And I don't want it to do that. I want to have nice, smooth uh, motions here. Now filling in the dark spaces in the ears and the stripes, I think is where we're gonna, <laughs> yeah. 
that's uh, that's not gonna come out so well but that's the price you pay and I'll just draw the face yeah I don't know we'll do do the eyes here and then we'll have a pretty good idea of how bad this is gonna be Eye number one. Another thing I'm noticing when I'm working with it here is I have to be mindful of where my finger is relative to the line because I can accidentally pull it and that can change uh, the location according to the computer of where it is. Uh, and it can also obviously stop the pen which can hurt the drawing. Okay, so now I'm just gonna do the nose. Oh, I'm gonna screw that up. And I'll do the mouth. Yeah, it's not. The detail is questionable. And you really don't want to uh, jerk the pen around too much because it just confuses the sensor. And then, yeah. So, I, you know, <laughs> it's obviously nowhere near as smooth as uh, the drawing I'm working from uh, or how it would be if I was on a modern computer. But again, this is 1984 technology and it's not the device's fault. I think the device, I think if you could adapt this to a PC, it would work just fine uh, at whatever resolution you're working at. But it's because the Apple II has this limited resolution that uh, we have a bit of a problem. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna speed this up for you and you can see me draw this. Um, and then, yeah, we'll see where we come out when it's time to actually color it in. Okay, and there we have our Garfield, and you know, it doesn't look too bad. Um, obviously, I had some challenges with the uh, stripes. Um, they just don't translate very well uh, with the resolution the computer is able to offer. But I mean, that's a reasonably close facsimile, I think. Um, you know, for 1984 and for the, the technology the Apple IIe had to work with, um, yeah, I mean, I think that's. That's pretty darn decent. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna try and save it, which I believe you can do off the disk functions. Uh, and then I'm gonna take this disk out because I don't wanna write to that. And then I should have a spare disk around. This is just a, a blank disk I've kicking around. And what I'll do is I'll format it. Uh, Now, the reason I'm doing this before I fill this in is because this is 1984, there's no undo button. So basically, if I accidentally fill something in wrong and it destroys the drawing or accidentally hit the lines and it destroys the drawing, then uh, I have no way to recover uh, unless I save it first. So I'm going to, I've just formatted the disk there. Uh, do I want a catalog? No, there's nothing on there. And we're gonna just call it Garfield. And we'll just let it write. And again, from the uh, book, we saw that you can take these images that you're saving and actually call them up in an AppleSoft Basic program. So that's something I would have been absolutely ecstatic about because I wanted to program a graphical adventure in like the worst way, but I had no way of 
you know, creating graphics using, you know, just uh, assembly code or whatever, I needed some way to, to physically draw them. So this would have been awesome. Okay, so now we're gonna do a fill. And of course we don't really have a true orange. <laughs> we have kind of a, it's kind of a red, yuck. I don't know, kids, what do you think is the closest to orange? Yeah, I'm gonna go with this one. And we'll fill in the eye first. That looks good. I'm gonna be real careful in here because if I hit the wrong spot, it will draw all over the actual line art part of it, which I don't want it to do. Back when using fill was actually dangerous. And you know, this is so reminding me of those old, um, was it Activision or, you know, games like Mind Shadow and Tracer Sanction. This is totally the graphical style you got stuff in. I can't even imagine, I'm assuming they must have had some sort of drawing set up like this, because I can't imagine trying to do that just by programming in the raw data. Okay, so we've got that. Uh, then we're gonna want a yellow. Uh, I guess that's as close to yellow as we're gonna get. Okay, let's see, I just wanna fill in his face here. <laughs> well. Perfect. Oh, yeah, see, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, now I gotta do it all over again. Okay, so back to disc. It really sucks not having a, uh, an undo. Um, okay. This is why I saved it, though. But now I gotta do this all over again. Okay, so brush. And yeah, well, that's what I want. Fill. There's our quasi orange. Okay, now let's save our picture. Let's be smart. That will make life a little easier. And try to go for this corner again. Nope. Okay. I'm determined though, I'm gonna get that corner. Just have to very carefully position myself right there. Gotcha. Okay, and then up in here, I don't know if I can get in there or not. Nice. This corner, go right up in there. Okay, so that looks good. So then we just need our yellow for mouth I just don't know if I can get it right in there or not got that one nice okay well let's uh, let's save it again Gotcha. Okay, so the final, this is just becoming a challenge now. I don't really care so much that it's perfect, but. Nice. Okay, well, I think that's as close as we're gonna get on Garfield, so. I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, 
you know, again, it's not the fault of the device. The device is great. It's a computer that sucks. But um, yeah, I mean, in 1984, I mean, that's the technology we had. I would have been perfectly happy with that. Um, having any ability to draw whatsoever on a computer freehand like that is just awesome. Unfortunately, at the equivalent of $800, uh, I don't think my dad would have sprung for that. So plus, you know, $1,300 for the computer. And I guess $1,300 would have been the equivalent of whew, almost three grand a day. Yeah, so there's Garfield. 